let's start with a little bit about your background. What were the early influences in your, in your life that impacted you and helped shape you as a person and as an entrepreneur? I think that I had a father who raised us with two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was try to make a meaningful difference in the world and help people who couldn't help themselves. So I grew up with that as a goal. And the question was, how could I relieve suffering and pain in other people? How could we challenge some of the orthodoxy and uh, figure out a more humanistic way to live? And um, uh, so those were the core values. And the corollary to that was, when you're looking for someone to make a change or fix a problem in the world, and your mind goes to other people, the amorphous they, uh, people that uh, are in business, people are in politics, he would say, you could wait forever. The they is you, son. So it inculcates a sense of individual responsibility and, um, uh, and control over your own life. Okay. So what was the pivotal moment for you that set the tone of how your business was defined for the rest of your career? It was uh, the fact that I, in 1975, was representing Steve Bartkowski, who was the very first player picked in the first round of the NFL draft. And there really was not organized agentry then. A team could just slam down the phone and say, we don't deal with agents. But he was the first pick in the first round of the NFL draft, Bartkowski, and got the largest rookie contract in NFL history. So we get back to Atlanta, and it's the night before the signing, and we're at the airport, and there are Klieg lights flashing in the sky like for a movie premiere. A huge crowd is pressed up against the police line, and the first thing we hear is we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and his attorney, Lee Steinberg, have just arrived at the Atlanta airport. We switch you live for an in-depth interview. Well, that was a revelatory moment because <clears throat> I saw that athletes were the celebrities and movie stars in communities across the country. And I realized if I could get them to retrace their roots and go back to the high school community that helped shape them to the collegiate uh, community, set up a scholarship fund at the high school or work with the church or boys and girls club, put down roots in the college community, and then put together a charitable foundation that would uh, involve the leading business figures, political figures and community leaders in a charitable foundation uh, and execute a program. So work done the running back for Tampa just put the 175th single mother and their family in the first home they'll ever own by making a down payment and outfitting it. So it's athletes changing lives. And so that moment seeing the power of sports made me realize that I could uh, utilize the high profile of athletes to make a real difference in a positive way in the world. In your book, you talk about when you first started approaching your athletes and asking them to donate time and money, you would get blank stares and they would say, well, I can't do that. Do you think that it was because it was the sign of the times that nobody was doing what you were doing at the time in terms of giving back? I mean, now that's really popular. Um, millennials won't even invest in a company if it's not social or economic or, or ecological respons responsibility. So you were ahead of your time. Do you think it was a sign of that you got the blank stares or was there something going on with their mindset that they didn't want to give back? I think it was situational ethics, which is where someone's nice to cats and dogs and good to their neighbors, but go out in the workplace and use social Darwin tactics, because after all, it's just business and the end justifies the means. So there were people who thought your only role in life should be to negotiate more dollars and put them into your player's bank book. And I saw the role as larger than that as getting to know athletes holistically. 
um, understanding that the most important skill in life, I think, is listening. It's the ability to, to hone in to someone else's uh, deepest anxieties and fears and greatest hopes and dreams. It's understanding them at a deep level and how to fulfill them. So the key was that um, I had to attract and find players and athletes that shared the same values. So I made an adjustment in my business, which was to try to research athletes, see if they had taken a trip to Haiti or uh, to help with earthquake relief, or if they'd um, helped out in the inner city to read their interviews and take perhaps 20% of those players coming out and speaking to people who shared the same values. Because if you can get a values match in business, then you, uh, with people who understand that money is one value, but um, it, it's one of many, then um, you can put together a relationship that will stand the test of time. So you changed your tactics as opposed right. to trying to clear their obstacles for them to see, to get an investor mindset. Right. I knew that a certain type of family brought up a young uh, man or woman who uh, had a bit of a heart, social conscience, um, also was ambitious for second career. So I looked for self-starters that would understand how to network, how to build relationships, how to pave the way for second career also. Okay. So throughout your career, you have continuously exceeded benchmarks for yourself and your clients, you've broken boundaries. For example, Steve Bartkowski, AKA Bart, um, at the time the Falcons was offering him 400,000, you got a contract for 600,000, which was the largest at the time. You've continued doing that with Steve Young with a 42 million contract. And I think you recently secured a $500 million contract, which is one of the biggest ever with Patrick Mahome. Um, so it was, yes, it was the largest in sports history. The last exactly. time I had done that was Steve Young back in 1984. Exactly. But you've conceded, you've continually exceeded benchmarks and broke boundaries. What does it take to have a high performance winning mindset? Uh, first of all, it's understanding how to put yourself again in the heart and mind of another human being. So when you're negotiating, it's understanding what would be a win-win situation for the general manager or the owner. It's, it's not simply focusing on my own goals, but it's figuring out how to craft a win-win scenario. And so um, it's, um, um, and, and I think if you have a fundamental belief in what you're doing, so, I believe in the athletes I work with, and I believe together we have the potential to, to address whether it's domestic violence or sex trafficking or racism or the environment, um, fundamental problems. So that enables the release of passion to feel like this is not um, simply work, but my life's work. The confidence has a lot to do with success. I think it's it's a fundamental belief in what you're doing and that it's having a beneficial effect. And that, um, if you can um, find what it is that can meaningfully um, change the arc, um, it's trying to have vision and innovate. Are people born negotiators, Lee, or is that a skill we must hone for business? I think that negotiating can be um, acquired. And, um, but again, it forces someone to be a careful listener and to listen for text and subtext and to think about the other person's position in the situation. Most of us negotiate repetitively, meaning that we're in a field where 
we may do multiple negotiations with the same person. And so it's not about one negotiation, it's about a relationship. But I think that people can get better and hone their skills. Most people approach negotiation and they make one or two mistakes. They either are unduly submissive and don't push what's important to them and, and agree, end up agreeing and then walk out and are immediately unhappy. Or they're unduly truculent and aggressive, in which case that leads to a breakdown and a deadlock. And in the business of sports, we can't afford uh, too much time passing because athletes have short playing careers. And how did you develop your negotiation skills? Was it just through practice and over and over again? Or did you start off as a good negotiator? No, was that was an innate skill for you? It was politics. It was being a student by president of my high school and, and university and law school. Um, when I was student by president of Berkeley, Ronald Reagan was the governor who later became president. And we would negotiate, uh, we would demonstrate against war in Vietnam and he would crack down. So I learned most of my skills through politics, through trying to build programs, through trying to build consensus to, to figuring out the clearest way. And it starts with having a clear internal inventory as to what's most critical to you in a situation. And then if you're representing a client to have a real firm grasp on what's most critical to them and what isn't. Because if everything is equally critical and important, then it's really hard to get something done. In your book, in the back, you've listed 12 rules of negotiation. These have obviously come from your experience that has led to your success. If you had to pick one or even two, let's say two, what are the most important ones you'd like to share with our listeners? I think it's to try to build relationships um, and not think of them as conquests. So that I think it's a fundamental respect for the other side and the fact they have goals and they have a life too. And <clears throat> to the extent that you can suss that out and be aware of it, that helps you craft you know, a, a paradigm of cooperation and the rest. And then as I just mentioned, listening and trying to um, um, draw out, uh, 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 tease out the things that are most critical. The other thing is, is you cannot deal with this personally as if your ego is on the line. It's necessary to sort of bleed that emotion out. I have clients, it's not about me. So if um, someone makes an untoward statement, it doesn't mean that we have to uh, break down or take that personally or feel insulted or react with anger. It should all be tactical, not um, spontaneous emotion. So do you have an do you have an exam do you have an an example of when you were negotiating and someone was extremely aggressive with you? How did you handle that? What tactics did you use? So there are certain people in life who believe they're smarter than everyone. And if you disagree with them, it either means you're not smart enough to understand that what they're saying is correct. Or you do understand that it's correct, but you're just basically showing bad will by consciously flaunting it. And so when you deal with uh, people like that, you, you um, have to, to wade your way through all their multiple objections and their points. And I think the best way to do it is we always negotiated by packet. So the question is whose reality is going to prevail in a situation? If you don't have an arbitrator, you don't have a judge picking the right figure, then how do you convince the other side? So um, I think you do it by, in our field, by comparables. In other words, who is your client like? What has he done statistically on the field? What has he done honors-wise? 
compare that to other similarly situated uh, players, but lay out a uh, way of looking at the universe of what's relevant and what is uh, what should be the determining factor, and then try to present that. So instead of just saying, I want more money, um, you, you justify it with, with having done research and comparatives and um, laying out exactly why you think this structure or proposal is logical and is in both parties' best interests. So what if you have a time constraint and you don't have time to lay everything out and you need to close a deal? How would you handle that kind of stressful situation? Um, they're all stressful. Um, so they're all, remember that in my field, it's not like if uh, someone that's drafted by a professional sports team um, doesn't, if they don't take the offer the team's offering, whatever the else they're going to do in life is going to be pale by comparison economically, right? They're going to go back to campus and develop a new theory of uh, super collider research or play cello, you know, in the Philharmonic. No, they got to make this deal. So you know <coughs> that all negotiating is tap dancing on the edge of the apocalypse. If the deal, unless you have leverage, and if you have leverage, if you have alternatives, then you can have people bid off against each other. But if it's just one buyer and they've got the rights somehow, then the you have to blot out the fact that, um, uh, that time is running. You have to blot that reality out and keep trying to make your argument because, and you have to go in prepared and um, don't push a losing argument to the end. If you're not having any success with a certain point or a certain proposal, back off, take a break, come at it a different way. So one of the keys to all this is resilience. Your ability to get pushed back, to face what looks hopeless and then to rise again and, and move uh, forward. So it's, it's being able to bounce back. Life will have its uh, reverses. Do, your best planning may end up being thwarted by some external condition. So you need to be resilient. So in that time frame, um, one of the things you could do is to say, look, let's suppose that my player is now late to training camp. His career is being ruined. His first year won't be as effective. You've got a hole where you drafted the player for, and uh, the public's getting involved. Everything is becoming acrimonious. What would you do then? So let's compress this time frame so that um, none of those consequences happen. We'll get down to what. Um, we think is it, it'll take to make this deal right now. What was the biggest mistake you made on a deal? And how did you fine tune and improve it for the next time? I think the biggest mistake I made really early was thinking that if I publicly marshaled sports opinion in the city, that they <laughs> could somehow force uh, the owner to to make the deal. So it was years ago with the old St. Louis Cardinals. And I kept saying that the owner was um, not making a fair proposal. And if he, um, and, and basically pocketing all the profits and, um, and not being fair in, in the market with the player. And I said, you know, if he's taking the differential between what's fair and what he's offering and giving it to charity, that would be one thing. Um, well, the first thing to remember is when you put people publicly up against the wall, all they do is get defensive. And so thinking that there was gonna be a mass uprising in St. Louis with people storming the barricades of the franchise office, you know, to demand more money for my player, just didn't make any sense. At the end of the day, the only person I had to try to uh, influence was that owner. So by being public and putting him into a corner, I was making a major mistake. 
And uh, I realized after that, that I should always negotiate privately and, and never push a billionaire up against a wall. You mentioned resilience. Can you shed light on some of the major challenges that you've had with your business and your career? Well, again, so the first year I had the top pick in the first round of the drafts. And then the next year I went out and spent a fair amount of money trying to recruit all the players I could, having other people help me. <clears throat> and I talked to everyone. And I had modest success the second year, but not at the same level. And I realized then I had to make a core adjustment and in, in my tactics. And that's when I started profiling. Um, in the same way, I realized that even though these negotiations were covered publicly, that I didn't have to engage in that other than to always be optimistic in the press about getting a deal done. Because when I had tried to make a big argument, um, the worse I made the other party look, the more determined they came, became not to give in. So I had to adjust um, to the fact that you could accomplish a great number of things uh, privately one-on-one, -on -one, but then let it be the owner's idea that, um, that I didn't push him into a corner. He made a really shrewd business decision. So it was understanding that um, my part in it could be quiet the goal was ultimately to maximize compensation for the athlete. But it also meant never coming out of a negotiation room bragging about the result that you just got. Because all that does is make the other party look uh, bad. And it will, the next time they deal with you, it won't be pleasant. Some of our listeners are looking to start their own businesses or in the process of setting up new businesses. Um, what are some takeaways you can share of how a business owner can get noticed and ultimately create market dominance? So the question is how to distinguish yourself. So what you're looking for Your is, USP. <laughs> right. What you're looking for is a a niche in the market, a unexploited um, possibility for which you have a better solution. Um, either you've come up with a novel way to solve a business problem, or you're simply better at it than anybody else is. And then the key is branding. It's driving your product once you're ready once you're sure that everything works, once you're sure that you're structurally correct and you wanna be careful in each of those steps because assume you'll be successful and then people will come after you and attack you and, and regulatory agencies and everything else. So make sure that you've got a perfectly ethical button down construct and then get to market as fast as you can. I still call uh, tissue Kleenex because that's what it was when I grew up. So if you, can become, if you can become ubiquitous and identified with that brand that whatever your new business is going to do, you are the state of the art. You are the, we used to call it Cadillac, maybe now you'd call it Mercedes or Rolls Royce, but you're that. And people want your product and your service. So you've, you've branded and, and hit home the superiority of, of your business um, and the novelty of it, and you, you keep uh, branding it. Then you have to figure out where your markets are and, and understand um, you know, where your customers are or where the people are who are gonna buy your product or use your services and figure out a way to penetrate them. So social media is important now. It's how many followers you have on Twitter or Instagram. It's how well you can use the platforms of, uh, of uh, you know, social content and understand, can you produce compelling advertisements, um, uh, uh, presentations of 
of your uh, uh, product? And can you get to the markets that are necessary? And then you have to have a smart business plan. And that probably comes before anything, which is to really understand where's the profitability coming from? And um, how do you keep fixed costs low and profitability high? And how about creating value? Um, so many entrepreneurs can't price themselves. Everybody has a different definition of what value is. One person may charge $97 for the same thing and the other may charge 10,000 and be able to sell that. Um, how do you convince someone to pay a certain amount for your product or service? You know, what's interesting, uh, when I was a dorm counselor, the same dorm that had Steve Bartkowski had a young uh, uh, track athlete named Brian uh, Maxwell. And Brian went out and formed a company called uh, Power Bar. And he told me that they were selling them for 59 cents and they were having all sorts of problems competing against other bars. They changed the price point to $1.59. And all of a sudden there was perceived value. The very fact that he raised the price made people think that there was some ingredients in there that were really instrumental, but it was the exact same bar. I'm a big believer in market research and trying to understand using statistics polls, understanding demographics, and, and what is the correct price point of your, uh, of, of your business? And, and, and are, is there perceived value um, in, in something we know that products in a supermarket can be white labeled and it's the exact same product. But if it's got this brand name on it, they charge more money. And if it's the white label or the, the product from, you know, pavilions or Walmart or, or Costco, uh, if it's their Kirkland brand, it's the exact same thing. But then how do you make that point? Um, and how do you get that um, across? So, uh, hopefully you found something, a unique niche in the market where you can do it, but, but you know, do some research, uh, do some market research, and that will help you um, understand price point. I've created a number of businesses. One of them was Athlete Direct, where in the embryonic days of the internet, where you still had to access AOL to get onto the internet which a lot of your listeners won't remember. Um, but in those days, I put the first athletic website up that had Michael Jordan, who at that point was the big basketball player, Ken Griffey Jr., who was the big baseball player and football quarterback. So for the very first time, you could, you could read their weekly diaries. You could follow their charitable events. I designed an e-commerce application uh, for it. Um, and so you could buy directly from the athletes. Well, we probably capitalized that with a hundred thousand dollars and sold our share a couple of years later for 25 million. So one of the things you want to do at the beginning of your business is have a liquidity concept. How will this end? Do you plan this business to be here forever? Or are you going to sell it to your a bigger business or are you going to go public? And you want to be thinking about that from the jump. So it strategically, you're making the uh, most uh, impactful moves. Did you have any mentors or coaches throughout your career? And if so, who were they? And what did you learn from them? Um, <clears throat> again, most of my uh, examples were from politics because um, I saw the thing in that way. And part of the was to try to conceptually understand that the battle in sports should not be the stereotypical labor versus management. The battle for the NFL is with the NBA, home box office, Walt Disney World, and every other form of discretionary entertainment spending. So the key was, how could I, we grow the brand to create more value in, in, um, create more value and bring revenue and, and win that battle for attention. Or if you're in baseball, same thing. 
you know, your battlers with the NBA and the NFL and every other way that people spend entertainment revenue. So it's having the right concept, I think, is um, uh, important. And um, in business, there weren't many examples for me to follow, but I did understand politics and, and how to vividly present something and, and, and how to build consensus, and those were important. Okay. And what are some of the projects you're working on now that our listeners may be interested in? So we do uh, what are educational platforms for people trying to break into sports. One of them, and you can go to uh, uh, steinbergsports.com and find them. So one of the educational products is, is having a career in sports that are called sports career conferences. So you have an hour on how to work in a front office for a team, a league, an athletic department, or a conference, or a players association. You have an hour on branding and marketing, an hour on, um, uh, on entrepreneurship, an hour on charity. So uh, an hour on uh, uh, media being uh, on the air or, or being a producer or being a writer. And so people that want to break into sports, it's a good sampler. <clears throat> and then we have mentorship opportunities where the panelists interact with the people who come. The sports career, uh, the sports agent conference is something that is allows someone to actually learn how to negotiate, how to recruit. They have to get up and, and try to recruit a real client. Um, so those are two um, offerings that, that sort of change the um, uh, value. We, we've tried to stay technologically ahead of it. Um, so we have a virtual reality project with Patrick Mahomes where you put on a headset and you are now in Arrowhead Stadium as the quarterback of, of the Chiefs. And you hear crowd noise, and then you have people coming towards you, the defensive players, and predicated on what you do with the football, you can either throw it and a touchdown pass, or you can throw it and get sacked, um, which you don't want. So, um, so that's an example. Um, and we're also trying to aggregate um, modalities in healing that can be of use to baby boomers or weekend warriors, but will heal a player more rapidly from injury or sustain a higher level of stamina and endurance in critical situations. So that would be like hyperbaric oxygen, a new brain treatment called, um, called uh, uh, R R uh, TMS. Uh, uh, light stem cells. So there are new breakthroughs in biomed that are going to affect older people's ability to live longer and healthy, but also will affect athletes' ability to be more productive. Okay, wonderful. All right, thank you so much, Lee, for your time today and your generosity. We really appreciate it. 